Um, but first things first, uh, my name is Clarice Holmes. I'm the Chief Clinical Officer at Concord Management Resources. Um, the Concord uh, Management uh, Organization is the Health Plan Administrator for Members Health Plan New Jersey. So uh, welcome to our members, brokers, and employers who are part of that plan, and then welcome to anyone else that may have joined uh, this morning. We appreciate your attendance. The Concord Management Resource Organization has been around for about 25 years, just to give you a little history. Uh, we are member-owned. Um, our focus is always on uh, patient care and value, and uh, our health plans are designed, uh, individually designed. We have many health plans designed for um, our individual employers uh, and employees. So um, with that, um, I've been a registered nurse for over 30 plus years, worked at many of the uh, health plans in New Jersey and across the country, uh, was an instructor for nursing school for many years, and uh, my latest uh, position, which uh, has been uh, amazing, is Chief Clinical Officer at Concord Management Resources. So uh, with that, I will hand it off to Andre, who will introduce herself, uh, give you a little bit of information about her history and background, and then we'll get started with the presentation. All right, well, thank you very much, Clarice. Good morning to all. My name is Andre Peart Laney, and as uh, Clarice indicated, I am the Esquire, uh, which is to say I am an attorney and the legal advisor for the Employers Association of New Jersey. Now, EANJ, as we are known, is a trade association, some 3,500 members strong, and those members are employers. They are businesses, uh, which vary in size from some as few as 10 employees to those uh, with hundreds of employees. And we serve the membership in educating the employers and their staff in order to create better workplaces in New Jersey. I myself bring 30 years of legal experience. Uh, I'd say about a third of that was spent enforcing some of the very laws, anti-discrimination laws that I will be speaking about uh, during the course of my portion of the presentation, uh, followed by a period of time that I have spent uh, defending uh, employers both in court and in administrative uh, fora, and most recently in my role as legal advisor to EANJ, I do just that. I render uh, consulting, uh, consultative, and strategic advice uh, to our membership to help them mitigate and avoid liability by learning about the laws uh, that they are charged to uh, comply with. So with that, I will turn it over to uh, Clarice, who will begin the scientific portion of our presentation. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, the title for today's session is Preventing the Spread of Coronavirus at Work. Um, some of the techniques and uh, discussion that we will have this morning will also help prevent other spread of uh, different infections, not just coronavirus, but with what is happening in, across the globe right now uh, with the coronavirus, uh, we thought it would be a great topic um, to discuss with all of you uh, so that, A, you know, you can at least get some of the facts, um, understand how it will apply in the workplace. Um, and hopefully quell some of the uh, some of the panic um, that is uh, going on in particular around the globe. And we'll talk about the U.S. in particular. Um, so the science and the law of it is uh, the focus for this morning. So we're, the, some of the topics for discussion, we will uh, talk about infectious disease. What is it? Um, why coronavirus? What does that even mean? Um, I know that was one of the questions um, I had as uh, a clinician, why the word corona and what does that really mean? So we'll talk a little bit about that. The causes and symptoms, the incubation period, the treatment, the workplace prevention techniques, workplace legal implications and guidance, and then we've also provided some references for you, uh, links uh, within the presentation that you can uh, reference and take a look at uh, at a later time. So what is an infectious disease? Uh, you've probably heard 
of a communicable disease, probably interchangeably, uh, and technically that is an illness that can be contracted through outside causes and may also be spread in that same manner. An infectious disease can be contracted and spread through contact either directly from a person to person or indirectly through environmental exposures such as air and fluids. Um, an infectious disease can also be a virus, a bacteria, it can be uh, transmitted or, or obtained through parasites, and also uh, fungi, which is really just a fungus. So, the coronavirus. Um, I did a little bit of uh, additional research uh, just to figure out, you know, why the title was coronavirus. I understand it's the cousin of SARS, which was another uh, type of illness uh, back a few years ago, but coronavirus is a large family of viruses that are common in many different species of animals, including camels, cattle, cats, and bats. So um, the original uh, location of this specific illness, and we'll talk about numbers in a second, was Wuhan, China. And it was identified as the cause of an outbreak of respiratory illness. It, it was originally linked to a large seafood and animal market suggesting an animal to person spread. So I think er early on, there was discussions around certain uh, bird-like animals, bats, uh, where feces was uh, consumed and transmitted that way. Um, there was a growing number of patients that reported that they had no exposure to any animal markets, didn't eat anything of the, of the sort. So that indicated that the, the spread became person to person. Uh, and again, the spread of person to person happens among close contact, and close contact is considered anything six feet or less. So let me give you a, a few numbers. Um, these, it, this is such a uh, fluid virus right now, and uh, the CDC and uh, the World Health Organization are update, updating their websites uh, sometimes daily, um, at a minimum three times a week usually in the evening, so um, I was out on the site uh, this morning um, and yesterday evening, and I have some numbers in the U.S. We'll talk about that, and then I'll provide some global numbers as well. So, in the U.S., there are 14 confirmed cases, and that is before yesterday, where the 42 Diamond Princess cruise ship um, folks got added to the U.S. numbers, so we've got a total of 56. Um, there's been over almost 500 folks tested in the U.S. We have 52 patients who are still in the pending phase who have not been con confirmed as positive or negative at this point. And we have had over 400 plus uh, negative uh, tests at this point just in the U.S. alone. Um, again, uh, I'm sure this will be updated if not today, tomorrow, um, and you'll hear all kinds of numbers on the news. Um, some that I've heard are way off compared to what, I'm, what we're seeing on CDC and World Health Organization's websites. So just be cautious as you hear the different numbers get thrown around, um, which you know, can send people in a, in a panic. So uh, we don't want to have a panic, of course. So globally, and this was pulled from the, the WHO or World Health Organization's Situation Report 37, um, there are, and this is uh, more the global numbers, 81,109 confirmed, and as of yesterday, 871 new cases. In China alone, there was 78,191 confirmed cases, 412 new, 2,718 2, deaths, 52 are new, outside of China, 2,918 confirmed cases, 459 new, 37 countries, and I'll give you a few uh, of the examples of the 37 countries, four are new, 43 deaths, nine are new, and uh, what we are finding with uh, the deaths, it's usually someone who has either a compromised condition to begin with or the elderly, but there are folks that are uh, getting well after going through uh, the illness. Um, we do have locations, 42 locations across the world, um, and a, a location, it's considered a location if there's at least one person confirmed with the coronavirus. 
So we have, I'm not going to read all of them, but um, I thought it was interesting. Of course, Hong Kong, we have Afghanistan, Taiwan, Australia, Austria, Brazil, and Belgium, Canada. We have Egypt, France, Germany, India, Iran and Iraq, Israel, Italy, Kuwait, Lebanon, Nepal, Philippines, Russia, Singapore, Spain, and Sweden, um, to name a few. And then we also have Switzerland, Thailand, of course, Korea, uh, United Kingdom, and Vietnam. So uh, this particular virus um, is really uh, spreading uh, quite quickly. And um, I think that's where uh, a lot of the panic is occurring at this point. So it's, uh, it is transmitted through respiratory droplets produced when an infected person coughs or sneezes, uh, very similar to how uh, the regular influenza is transmitted, and other pathogens spread uh, very similarly. And the droplets can land um, in the mouth or the nose of people who are nearby or possibly uh, inhaled in the lungs just by passing someone who may have the virus, and if you're within six feet of them, you can breathe that in and you can become contaminated. Uh, symptoms are, a uh, few of the symptoms are fever, cough, shortness of breath, body aches, diarrhea. So a very similar uh, characteristics to uh, the regular flu. Um, however, it becomes a little bit more severe with the symptoms uh, over time. Um, again, with folks who have compromised uh, immune systems and uh, illnesses, or the elderly, uh, they, these uh, symptoms do take a toll on them. Um, the incubation period is 14 days. We are also seeing uh, now that uh, they're possibly going to extend the incubation period to greater than 14 days. I've heard as much as 30 days, and I think um, a lot of that is coming from the fact that you, know, you are contaminated or contagious during uh, the pre-symptom phase. So if you don't have symptoms and then two days from now you start coughing and you have a sore throat, uh, some patients might think, hmm, I didn't really start the cough until when did I get the sore throat? And if you're not really paying attention to when these symptoms start, because they are kind of vague if, if you think about it from a regular cold, um, I think the timing of contact and when the symptoms start is where you have to count back, and that's what's causing a little bit of a dilemma with the 14 plus days, which I think the CDC and WHO are deciding on whether to increase that at this point. So testing uh, for this particular uh, virus. Um, the CDC has developed a new lab test kit that's used for testing patient specimens, uh, usually uh, throat, nasal uh, specimens can be tested. And uh, the test kit is called the, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC 2019 Novell Coronavirus NCOV Real-Time Reserve Transcriptase RT-PCR Diagnostic Panel. So don't try to say that 10 times fast. I think if you just said the coronavirus test kit um, you would be, uh, your provider uh, or the, the healthcare professional would know exactly what test kit uh, to utilize. So prevention and treatment. Um, there's no current vaccine at this time. Um, I, during one of the uh, president's um, report outs yesterday, uh, there was a physician that was on that talked about the creation of vaccines. Um, and I think it was very telling the time that it takes to create a vaccine is not like you can, you know, start today and you'll have something by tomorrow. It can take as much as six months to a year to create a vaccine that's, that works, that's been tested and safe. Um, so for, at this point, there is no current vaccine. Uh, you, the, uh, the other prevention is to avoid close contact with people who are sick. Again, uh, use six feet or less um, as your guide and uh, avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth with unwashed hands. That is the perfect mechanism to transmit uh, the disease to yourself or others. Wash your hands often with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. So um, I know you, know you probably go in, wash your hands, one, two, three, you scrub your hands, grab a towel, hopefully you don't touch the faucet, Hopefully you don't wipe the sink down when you're finished because then you really need to wash your hands all over again. 
So uh, just be mindful of that. If you want, you can count 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000 for 20 seconds, and you'll find 20 seconds is a pretty long time to wash your hands. But that is what is suggested. Preferably washing your hands after going to the bathroom, before eating, definitely after blowing your nose, coughing, or sneezing. In bold, stay home when you are sick. I know folks feel like, you know, I, you know, I got to get to work or, you know, I really want to see my coworkers. You know, we really want to see you too, but if you are sick, please stay home. Cover your cough and sneeze with a tissue and then throw the tissue in the trash. So I'm going to spend a couple seconds on this one. Um, you know, I've seen all kinds of things, obviously, as a healthcare professional. If you do uh, use a tissue and you blow your nose, and if you are in the workplace and you blow your nose, maybe you're not sick, but you're blowing your nose. Remember, there's an incubation period where you have no symptoms. Please do not just throw a soiled, wet tissue into your garbage can without putting it into some other bag or plastic bag first. You know, think about the folks who come along behind us at the end of the day who empty the garbage. Many times if they see one or two items in the trash, they will go in with a gloved hand and grab those two items not change the liner and throw the, it into the large trash. And then they go to the next scan with the same gloves. And uh, that's perfect mechanism to spread this because it is spread through uh, droplets and uh, nasal secretions. So be mindful of blowing your nose and just throwing it into an empty trash can um, without it being bagged at least first. Some folks also will throw uh, their tissues in the toilet and flush those, that is acceptable as well. Clean and disinfect, disinfect frequently touched objects and surfaces with regular household cleaning, spray, or wipes. I think uh, we all probably have our, our disinfectant wipes either at our workstation, at home, multiple locations. Those are great for uh, wiping down and helping with some of the cross-contamination. However, it does not, does not a substitute for washing your hands with soap and water. Of course, uh, utilizing hand sanitizer is another mechanism. Again, does not um, replace washing your hands with soap and water. Um, and then also be mindful of um, a, you know, a container that has hand sanitizer that has a, a nozzle on it because folks are touching the nozzle with uh, obviously dirty hands. And uh, you know, if you touch the nozzle, you get some and then touch the nozzle again um, you know, you're, you're kind of recontaminating yourself, so be mindful as you use um, these mechanisms that are shared by others. Some additional prevention and treatment is to follow the CDC's recommendations for using face masks. So face masks obviously have been in the news uh, quite a bit. There are many different types of face masks. Healthcare professionals have specific required face masks that have a uh, alpha prefix and a number behind it. Um, for those healthcare professionals, um, you know what I'm speaking of. And for uh, the regular lay person where you go to a, you know, a pharmacy and you pick up a box of masks, um, those uh, do suffice at least to hopefully remind you that you shouldn't touch your face. Um, and be mindful if you are going to get a mask, they need to cover the bridge of your nose. Many of them have a uh, bendable metal on the top so or the bridge of your nose you will bend that so that it is secure on your nose and it should be secure around your chin and your ear um, area so that it is not uh, like just open and loose because uh, you're really not being uh, you know effective and uh, those germs can uh, you know leave the mask if you don't have it secure against your face also be mindful not to use the same mask you know for a week two weeks at a clip because you're also recontaminating yourself and the mask uh, should be fresh. If you are sick, you should be changing that uh, a couple times a day at, at a minimum um, on a daily basis. Um, don't wear a mask if you're healthy. Um, I, you know, I've seen folks walking around and they aren't sick at all, haven't been exposed to anything and they're walking around with a mask. There are good environmental flora um, and environment, environmental elements in the air that are healthy for us. So if we walk around with a mask, we are literally uh, keeping ourselves from having certain immunity, immunities that we would have if we um, breathed in the regular air, um, 
good air, and uh, it helps our immune systems. So be mindful not to just wear a mask for the sake of wearing a mask. Um, hand sanitizer and sanitizing wipes we talked about. Again, there is no specific antiviral treatment recommended at this time. People who are infected with the coronavirus should receive supportive care to help relieve uh, their symptoms. Again, if you are going to go to your healthcare provider's office, please do not just show up. You do need to call in advance if you are having some symptoms or think you are, have been exposed or you're in the pre-incubation state. Please call ahead and don't just show up because uh, if you don't have symptoms, you are compromising other folks that might be in the waiting room, as well as the healthcare professionals who would be taking care of you when you show up. In summary, for the workplace, from a clinical perspective, contact perspective, stay home if you are sick. Wear a mask if you're sick, contact your healthcare professional as soon as possible. Hand washing often, never hurts to wash your hands. Use the methods that we just spoke about. Use hand sanitizer and sanitizing wipes, um, as we also discussed, and stay calm. I know, you know, throughout the day, you, you'll get uh, messages on your phone, you know, messages through the TV, you know, through your TV, and you're seeing all kinds of scrolls at the bottom of the screen talking about uh, this disease and the illnesses. Um, but I can say that the U.S. has really taken great precautions to keep us all safe. Um, and uh, the more we hear, you know, you'll hear more from all of us, I'm sure, as we weather the storm with this particular illness as well. So uh, with that, uh, the next slide just has a few references, which will be in your packet. And you will uh, be able to go on the website at your leisure and look at some of the hand washing, washing techniques, some of the information from CDC and uh, World Health Organization as well. So uh, appreciate you uh, your attention as I hand off to my counterpart today, Andre. All right, thank you so much, Clary. All right, so now in discussing the law associated with this outbreak of coronavirus, it's important for you to understand the context in which I am speaking to you. Uh, as individuals who are members of management, perhaps, or who are HR representatives of organizations, or those of you who are employees within your respective organizations. Uh, my intention is for you to understand that there are legal implications and consequences uh, to what you might be inclined to say or do within the workplace to address and, in your mind, prevent the uh, potential uh, spread of the virus. So we will talk about what those laws are, because to the extent that they present uh, potential minefields, figuratively speaking, I want you to identify them and maneuver around them, such that you do not walk yourself into uh, claims of harassment, discrimination, or uh, failure to observe and protect the rights of those within the workplace. So in looking at the laws which are implicated by what we might say or do, it's important for you to understand the backdrop, if you will. Uh, the universe of laws that we're talking about include government guidances. These are of particular import because these are guidances or regulations which have been put forth by the folks who are charged by their uh, governing body, be it Congress on the federal level or in state legislature it's from Trenton on the state level with creating uh, explanations and assisting both employees and employers in understanding the laws that have been put out by those legislators. Among those laws, workers' comp laws, 
leave laws, both federal and state, are implicated by the potential responses of employers. Anti-discrimination laws, as I alluded to before, and privacy laws, and then certainly last but not least, occupational safety and health laws. So we will look at these in turn. With respect to government guidances, as Clarice has indicated, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention have been very helpful in putting forth information to allay concern, quell panic, and inform, among other things, inform businesses about what they can and cannot do. So I want you to be aware of the particular guidance that the CDC has just put out, uh, which is directed particularly to businesses to help them address and respond to the coronavirus disease. What you see below the screenshot that I provided is the website uh, link to that uh, page, and there you will find information that goes into greater depth, and uh, you will be able to understand that the CDC, not an employment uh, agency necessarily, uh, has a vested interest in business and helping to maintain the orderly operation of businesses as well. So we'll talk a little bit about what they have said in that guidance. The Department of Labor's Occupational Safety and Health Administration likewise has put forth information to help uh, everyone, but employers certainly are able to avail themselves of the information that OSHA is putting forth about how to keep workplaces safe and healthy. So they have as the uh, link below indicates, a website that will give you more information along the lines uh, that Clarice has discussed this morning. Now, this I am putting forth, which is a page and a document that's been generated by the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. That is the federal agency that is charged with enforcing the federal anti-discrimination laws, which include among them the Americans with Disabilities Act and Title VII. We'll talk about those particular federal laws at length, but I do want you to be aware of the guidance that they put forth, not concerning um, the coronavirus, but concerning SARS, which just to give us some perspective, um, is another uh, virus that was considered to be a pandemic. So what they did with respect to that particular uh, virus was set out guidances for employers on how to address this pandemic flu virus. This I provide as general guidance because as of yet, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has not classified the coronavirus as a pandemic. And that is to say a global epidemic, which is what a pandemic is defined to be uh, both specifically by the EEOC and generally uh, by the uh, CDC. So while this information may be helpful in understanding a little bit about the range of responses that will be available to employers legally if this becomes a pandemic, um, it is not yet. There is also state guidance and information that is being put forth by the New Jersey Department of Health, which as the uh, link indicates, has a page that also provides information to the public on how to identify the coronavirus. The Occupational Safety and Health Act 
which is a federal act put out by Congress and enforced by the Department of Labor's OSHA, requires that employers, all employers, uh, adhere to their general duty to provide a workplace that is free from recognized hazards that are causing or are likely to cause death or serious physical harm. I want you again to be aware of this general rule that um, applies to employers, but I do want you to understand that in the context of one of the issues that Clarice referenced, yes, masks should be, according to the CDC, worn by individuals who are sick. And also, as Clarice has indicated, uh, employers are urged to uh, request or require sick people to remain at home. So with respect to this issue of whether employers can prevent or tell or deny employees requests to wear masks uh, to work. At present, the um, collective information being put forth by the CDC and OSHA appears to indicate that yes, in most instances, employers can refuse an employee's request to wear a mask or a medical respirator. And that is to say a healthy employee. Now, obviously an employee infected by coronavirus will remain at home. An employee with a compromised immune immunity system may have other reasons to request and receive a medical accommodation from uh, her employer. So that should be uh, borne in mind. Workers' compensation may also be implicated for those of uh, the employers on this call who are required to uh, travel uh, to locations which have been identified as level four uh, risks medically. Those individuals who have traveled on behalf of those companies may be entitled to workers' compensation benefits if it can be demonstrated that the person's contraction of the coronavirus arose out of and in the course of employment. Likewise, to the extent that the person has to uh, perhaps interact with the public in ways that has created heightened uh, potential exposure, perhaps clients from regions that have been identified as high risk uh, may likewise potentially argue uh, their entitlement to workers' compensation benefits. So employers should be mindful of that in terms, at the very least, of assigning uh, employees to travel. There are leave laws that may well also be implicated because, as you've heard both uh, me and Clarice say, uh, if someone is sick, they should stay home. Well, uh, to the extent that is the case, uh, there may be leaves to which the person would be entitled under law, such as the uh, Family Medical and Leave Act, FMLA, uh, which requires employers to provide 12 unpaid weeks. Now, this may not apply to all employers, but certainly if you're a private employer of 50 or more employees, or if you are one of our members, which is a public entity, then certainly you would be uh, required to provide uh, FAMLA leave, which covers job reinstatement rights uh, to those who are eligible to receive it. There's some other rules concerning eligibility, and to the extent that you want to drill down further, um, given the limitations of our time, I've provided you links to the sources. Um, also, feel free to check the eanj.org website as we do make reference to and explain in layperson's terms 
all of the leave laws that I'm referencing here. Now, the New Jersey earned sick leave laws, perhaps the more uh, recent of the leave laws, but that law provides uh, paid leave to employees and accordingly might be something of which the employee can avail uh, himself or herself. The law expressly states that the employee would be able to use the leave due to an epidemic or other public health emergency. Um, and that would be leave to care for the individual himself or that individual's uh, child if the child were, uh, if the child's school, for example, were closed because of such an epidemic. So be mindful of that law and of the fact that it might apply under uh, certain circumstances that could arise if this virus. Uh, likewise, the ADA, which provides for reasonable accommodations to employees with disabilities might be implicated here if the employee could assert that leaves are provided or extension of leaves that were uh, preferred under FMLA um, could have been extended under ADA. So be mindful that sometimes a leave itself can be the reasonable accommodation that is appropriate to provide to someone who is staying home because uh, she is ill. Now, the anti-discrimination laws uh, come into play in part because Title VII and New Jersey's law against discrimination prohibit discrimination based on national origin or race. And to the extent that one's membership in a racial group or one's national origin might subject one to heightened scrutiny, different and negative treatment, um, perhaps harassment from coworkers, because of the belief, um, the stereotype perhaps, that people from a certain region are more likely to be carriers of the virus. Not only would that be belied by the ever-increasing information that we're getting from the CDC, as Clarice has referenced, but it would be a violation of the law. And accordingly, employers have to be vigilant to ensure that their reactions, their responses, and that of their workforces are such that the employers are adhering to and enforcing the right of all employees to be free from discrimination on those bases. Likewise, under the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, it is prohibited for employees to be subject to discrimination based on an actual disability, a record of a disability, or the perception of a disability. And to the extent that the coronavirus is very similar in its symptoms to the common cold or flu, it is important that employers uh, take a measured response, one that is based on facts and one that does not encourage uh, hysteria or panic amongst their workforce to the extent that that will expose the employer uh, to heightened liability, among other things. It's also important that employers be aware that you're going to be a little curious about that person with a sniffle. But disability-related inquiries that you may wish to make of your employees, and that would include, among other things, hey, do you have the coronavirus? or asking them to not come to work until they bring a medical certification that they don't have the coronavirus, that's a medical and disability-related inquiry. You can't make those as an employer unless you have a reasonable belief, which is one that is based on 
objective evidence that the employee A has a medical condition, B has a medical condition that either has or will impair that employee's ability to perform the essential functions of her job or poses a direct threat to the um, workforce. So it is important that employers be aware these laws are out there and they do inform the way in which a knowledgeable employer can and will respond to concerns uh, regarding the virus. So again, what to say? What can you as a proactive, well-intended employer communicate to employees regarding the coronavirus to help quell their concerns and suspicions? And how do you inquire? When do you inquire, given the laws that we've just addressed, about uh, an individual's possible exposure? And with respect to that category of employees who has perhaps uh, recently traveled to Wuhan, China, or to some other location which has been uh, demonstrated to have heightened risk, um, what can you say to those individuals? So, in general, you should, and as we all should, and as we all do certainly um, in presenting this information to you, rely on government guidance for facts don't want to uh, rely on suspicion, rather you want to rely on guidance. Because um, while we all have an, a vested interest in self-preservation, we need to make sure that our actions are informed by the experts who really do have more information than any of us. So if you are going to communicate anything to your uh, workforce, make sure that it is informed by potentially even includes a copy of the particular government guidances or perhaps posters that you have received from uh, various government websites. Issue policies, such as a policy encouraging or requiring employees to stay home when they're sick. Um, issue information concerning uh, etiquette to prevent and avoid the spread of illness. Now, to that end, you'll find, for example, that on the CDC's website and the New Jersey Department of Health website, and these were merely two examples of many uh, such posters available from then, from them and others of the government uh, agencies to which we referred, they have lots of information. Remind your employees about the particular etiquette that they should follow to prevent the spread, the spread rather of the flu, and remind them to stay home. Also taking uh, care to remind them of their entitlement to uh, any leaves uh, for which they are eligible. Now, if you have someone who has traveled, um, under the law, as I've cited it before, the ADA requires that you have a reasonable belief with objective evidence that an employee may have been exposed to the coronavirus. So under what circumstances might you have such a reasonable belief as opposed to a fear or a uh, nagging concern? Well, if you have an individual who's traveled for work or personal reasons through a region that has been cited by the CDC or the United States State Department in its travel advisories, and where it has directed, um, um, because the region is level four, such as some regions within China that travel to or from 
that location is uh, prohibited, if not strongly discouraged, because of a medical risk there, then you have objective evidence that this travel through that location during the period of time where your employee was there could create a risk both to that individual and uh, to those people in the workforce were he or she to return. Presently, if you have an objective basis, um, not related to a presumption of disability based on any stereotypical reasons, but rather objective evidence, you can ask that the person uh, stay at home until the person has been asymptomatic for 14 days. And I've put forth underneath uh, a source uh, from the CDC, a couple of sources where they, where they presently have the 14-day uh, quarantine uh, suggestion set forth. But as Clarice has noted, given that some people remain asymptomatic for a number of days and then all of a sudden uh, show symptoms, it is not necessarily the case that that 14-day number will remain stagnant. By all means, check the links and uh, continue to be vigilant to make sure that you have the most up-to-date objective evidence to inform your decision. Now, if someone at work is visibly sick, and you know, I will be the first to uh, admit that I have on occasion gone to work with the cold that I probably should have kept to myself, um, you should understand that the CDC has put forth in the guidance that I told you they created, particularly for employers, um, some information. They have indicated that if you observe employees with symptoms of acute respiratory illness, so not like perhaps the sneeze that comes out of nowhere uh, every once in a while, or that may be attributable to an allergy, but rather um, fever, cough, and shortness of breath. If you have those symptoms, according to the CDC, you should separate that individual uh, from the rest of the workforce and promptly uh, send that person home. Um, now, to the extent that you are going to take this action, by all means, out of decency, out of compassion, and certainly in compliance with the law, be discreet. Because according to the ADA, you must maintain all information about an individual's illness, whether that illness turns out to be coronavirus or more likely some other brand of flu as confidential medical information. And likewise, under HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, you have an obligation not to disclose information that uh, identifies someone by name and, you know, says that, you know, they're sick and they have this. So there may be certain times when you have to disclose that information and both of uh, these laws, ADA and HIPAA, make exceptions for administering uh, health insurance policies or uh, seeking to accommodate someone's disability. But there's people who need to know that information and there's the majority, and certainly the people, uh, persons, colleagues, who won't need to know. We'll talk about a certain exception to that, but generally um, you are to be discreet and protect and preserve that person's privacy and dignity in telling them, you know, given the CDC's guidance, we think that you need to leave. Now, as I said, the majority of those folks who might be sent uh, home won't have coronavirus. But what do you say to the others when there is the one, perhaps, who does have coronavirus? What you do, according to the CDC, 
is inform other employees of their possible exposure. The CDC guidance says that you should let them know and indicate that they should be tested but maintain their confidentiality, maintain the confidentiality of the person who has been infected. So um, while you can let them know that an employee or there has been a potential case of coronavirus that has been uh, un uh, discovered, uh, you certainly can't provide names. And if they come and ask you names, uh, there's no need for that information to be disclosed in most circumstances because you are directing people to get tested in any event. Um, and again, so discretion is key in addressing this issue even with respect to identified cases. So what do you do generally? Well, you should certainly as an employer create or if you already have, remind employees of those policies that you have which require them or ask them to stay home if ill. Now, yeah, somebody's gonna come to work maybe with a sore throat or, you know, I have a terrible headache but I gotta get something done by the end of the day. But certainly with respect to those communicable uh, diseases and those which can be passed through the air, as can the coronavirus or the flu, and in some instances, uh, the quote unquote common cold, which is common because we catch it from each other. Um, there should be some encouragement that people are not just um, responsible for their own health, but for the health of their colleagues and therefore should exercise a proper health hygiene in that respect and be considerate of their coworkers. Remember your organization's obligation to prevent discrimination by way of harassment or inappropriate inquiries that might be based on disability, race, or ethnicity. Or, and I should add, a potentially association where if someone is espoused to or best friends with someone of a race or ethnicity that is presumed by a harasser to be uh, a carrier of the virus, that that person not be subject to harassment or uh, other forms of discrimination on that basis. Maintain separately and confidentially employee medical records, okay? That's required under the ADA, it's required under HIPAA. Uh, provide leave to eligible employees. You don't want someone who has leave available to them uh, or for whom an extension of leave as an accommodation uh, could be appropriately provided based on your company's precedent and uh, operational needs not to get that, all right? And finally, allow for flexible work arrangements if you can. Again, dependent upon your operational needs because if an employee can provide the work from home and is symptomatic of something, which could be a common cold, but is saying, you know, I can get this work done at home if you would prefer that I not be in the office, then, you know, unless it's a requirement uh, for whatever reasons operationally that the person be at work, do consider uh, more flexibly how you can address the needs of the business, uh, not only to get your work done, but to provide a healthy and safe work environment for your other employees. Now, when to act. We talked about what to say, but when should you act? Well, if an employee uh, is diagnosed with the coronavirus, you should direct the employee to stay or return home and require the employee to produce a fit for duty documentation under that circumstance, because then you have reasonable objective evidence that the person could present uh, potentially a direct threat to others. Um, if not, uh, then likely won't be capable of performing the essential functions of his or her job until they get better. 
Um, but if the person displays, again, those acute respiratory symptoms to which we referred before, then yes, under the CDC's guidance, you should separate the person from the rest of the work staff and send that individual home. In either event, maintain the integrity, privacy, confidentiality of the affected employee, all right? So as we can't stress enough, this situation is dynamic. As Clarice indicated, the numbers have to be checked daily because they change daily as to the number of cases worldwide and, and certainly in the US. So we encourage that you watch the government guidances, particularly those relating to an employer's responsibilities and whether the coronavirus uh, has become a pandemic. Because as I said before, the EEOC's existing guidance provides some more aggressive actions that employers can take with respect to how they address suspected uh, cases of illness or coronavirus within uh, the workplace, but that measure is only uh, in effect if the coronavirus is declared a pandemic, which at this point, neither the World Health Organization nor the CDC uh, has done. Well, thank you, Andre, for your portion. Um, we are just about out of time. As I mentioned uh, at the beginning of the session, we do have the session recorded. We will be sending those links out so that you can listen uh, at your leisure again if you'd like to. Handouts were sent via email this morning and are also available on the dashboard within the webinar. Um, on behalf of Andre and myself, we want to thank you for your participation, attentiveness, and uh, we appreciate your time today to learn about these uh, pressing issues in, in today's environment. And uh, with that, we say have a great day, and again, thank you.